So please join me in welcoming Ms. Georgette Norman for today's Juneteenth Again. I traveled to a distant land. I could not find my mother. I could not find my father. I could not hear the drum. That comes from Derek Walcott's dream on Monkey Mountain. They bring it a little closer to home. I'm of that age when we listen to a different kind of music. And many of you might remember the Dells. Does anyone know I'm here? Alone and far away from home. A boy stands in a fallen land. Lonely is he as he wipes away a tear. Does anyone know I'm here? I hope a few of you remember that. While I danced the night away to that tomb, I didn't understand its significance until now. Permit me by way of introduction to acknowledge the spiritual presence of my parents. And I dedicate this message to them and all those mothers and fathers who in the stillness of their hearts and minds, in their solitude, made some awesome decisions upon which many lives and deaths depended. I am today because of their strength, their courage, and I come speaking as a woman of color, a black woman, who hears the call of her ancestors and marches to the beat of their drum. Do any of you know, have ever heard of Arsenia Hall? <laughs> Makes me go, hmm. <laughs> well, I'm sure today, or I hope today, I give you cause to say. <laughs> I remember a song the old folks used to sing when I was growing up. There's a leak in this old building. And my soul has got to move. <laughs> I'm sure many of you that grew up in church kind of hear that song now. Today we live in times so disruptive on so many levels at once that I have difficulty expressing anything that makes sense. And find it necessary to open mind, heart, and memory to a time our predecessors acted on the new possibilities for their lives and the nation. They did not languish in the field lamenting, but worked to retool, reshape, stand together as change agents, moving beyond speeches, acting on the abstract beliefs of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Today I find myself tangled in the vines of democracy, trying to find ways to trek through the thicket of it, to make it Democracy, possible. The question, is 
democracy possible. I stand before you a black southern woman, born, reared, and educated in this segregated South. The city of my birth was affectionately referred to as the heart of Dixie and the cradle of the Confederacy. Growing up in Montgomery, I remembered love and belonging. Belonging to a family, to a neighborhood, to a community, to a people. I remember knowing that I was a tip of a spear, supported by the shaft of my ancestors, who fought valiantly to be treated as human. My memories are, are of struggle and assurance, hard work and reward, hopes and renewal, empowerment. The Montgomery of my youth had a plethora of businesses, and everything I needed was in my community. I was raised, as most of my peers, to understand that I was a being, that my being would let me have and my having would let me do. However, too many of us now have to have so we can be and therefore do. In 1940, Alexis de Tocqueville, a member of the Institute of France, <coughs> visited the United States, studied the culture, and shared with the world that racism in America was normal, 1840. In his text, Democracy in America, he predicted ever increase, increasing levels of conflict between blacks and whites. De Tocqueville asserted that, and I quote, the whites and blacks are placed in a situation of two foreign communities, fastened to each other and unable to separate entirely or combine. If the Negroes are to be raised to the level of freemen, they will soon revolt at being deprived of almost all their civil rights. And as they cannot become the equals of whites, they will speedily show themselves as enemies. If I were called upon to predict the future, I should say that the abolition of slavery will, in the common course of things, increase the repugnance of the white population for the blacks. The danger of a conflict between the white and black inhabitants perpetually haunts the imagination of the American, like a painful dream." Unquote. De Tocqueville's painful dream is acted out daily on the American stage. It has become America's nightmare. However, most blacks would say a more accurately term would be white man. Memory, especially in the black sense, is shaped by legacies of racial identity and injustice occurring at the intersection of the subjective memory of trauma and collective memorances of histories of domination with sprinklings of joy. Home then links the public with the private and ties the emotional to the political. Events of the last few months have truly brought to mind an old French truism. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And Faulkner's, the past isn't dead. In past, it isn't even dead. Or in the past, it isn't even dead. In this moment, we're living with the forces of divisiveness against the forces of harmony. 
I remember a song sometimes sung in the church when I was young. I just told you there's a link in this opening day, and its soul has got to move. <coughs> there's a leak in our nation, and its soul has got to move. The past is not something back then. It is happening now. It is a bet our forefathers and foremothers placed, <clears throat> which we must now cover. It is, in essence, our present. Dead, unborn hope. Dead hope has been cyclical for black people in this country. How many who look like me are tired of birthing hope? After a long and rough pregnancy, only to awake in the morning to a death. Reconstruction, hope, and resistance ended with disenfranchisement, sharecropping, and Jim Crow laws. Hope was reborn in 1955 with a live birth, the Monterey bus boycott and then other live births in the 60s with the March on Washington, 63, and the Voting Rights March, 65, when the Voting Rights Act was signed into law. 10 years of varying creeds, ages, colors, living out loud our individual creed, indivisible creed. creed. What happened? How did we get back to days of unborn hope? The issues and personalities that challenge the world's commitment to equality and opportunity, and the fundamental concerns of the movements they spawn remain relevant today. Our conflicts are so complex, rooted in history and in individual perceptions of identity or culture, makes it imperative that we not become overwhelmed by the injustices in our history, but work to understand them in order to dismantle them and change the existing paradigm. Almost daily across the country, we see examples in the streets and in town meetings. We have a difficult task before us. We must undo the isms. And understanding privilege is a crucial step in acting against them. Privilege has bred all kinds of isms, age, gender, race, class, religion, societal hierarchies, differences, societal hierarchical differences permeate everything we do and influences our perspective on issues that appear to be simple. There are three components of Indianism. Cognitive thought, effect, feeling, and behavioral action. Race or Indianism prompts stereotypes, cognitive, prejudice, effect, and discrimination, behavior. Fear of the unknown, change <clears throat> and loss cause persons to act out of prejudice, from bad mouthing to avoidance, discrimination, physical attack, even extermination. We have seen them all too, too much over the last year to date. Perpetuation of negative attitudes. The metamorphosis from attitude to discrimination is a slow process that gains momentum of the stereotypes and, and prejudices. Most of the world can now press a button and be exposed to a plethora of cultures, mores, and adapt most of what they see into their own lives. Clothing, 
food, furnishings, etc. So why is the fight against isms still so difficult and complicated? <laughs> why indeed? Too many of us did not continue to do their work, and others took too long resting on their laurels. As a result, we have today. Do you remember learning to code? What do you remember about learning to code? Stay inside the lines. And what did you do? You stayed inside the lines. Why? Because mother was not going to tell her friends about that picture. She was not going to show it to them. She was not going to paste it on the refrigerator. We have been taught to stay inside the lines. And we do it unconsciously. We are taught to conform, to not make waves, to stay in our boxes, personal, public, organizational. What keeps us in our boxes? Geography? Denial, the internal politics of my group, power plays, or we've already done the work because we now have that black person on the board. <laughs> Tokenism, a feeling of overwhelmed by the scope of the issue, a lack of knowledge, and a dismissal of personal responsibility. Now, most of you here might be a little too young for this, but do you remember a toy called Jack in the Box? <laughs> do you remember how you got Jack out that box? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly. You had to whine and whine and whine. And then when Jack jumped out, he almost scared you to go. <laughs> well, today, many of us are Jacks in the Box. We don't address issues, get out of the box, until we get wound up. A friend dies of AIDS. Mother has breast cancer. No medical insurance. Or oh, I lose my home. How does Jack get back in the box? Anybody remember? Exactly. Push them down. You can play those arms all you want, but until you push that head down into that box, Jack is going nowhere. When you step out, there are a lot of people wanting to push you back in your box. I want to encourage you to get out of the box and stay out. It is crucial that we create opportunities to exorcise, not exorcise, <laughs> but to exorcise our isms. Address and discuss them in a non-threatening manner. By one, developing a common definition of the pervasive isms in our lives. Two, addressing surface assumptions about them in our connection to their institutionalization. Three, gaining understanding how we are all impacted adversely by them every day. And four, gaining knowledge about how to be more effective in working to undo them. By acknowledging that all people are impacted by one ism or the other and develop biases, we can examine how our biases, prejudices, and stereotypes impact us and our worldview. We are then prepared to discuss our collective history and work toward cohesion rather than division. And our children will grow up with a more accurate 
healthy understanding of our past and empowered to be engaged in civic life. It is imperative that we now concentrate our efforts to combat what I call other men. How we think, feel, and act toward those who don't think, feel, and act like us. And to act responsibly in the spirit of the successful movements of the 20th century, like the Montgomery Bus Boycott, act as social justice workers, where justice refers to more than just the administration of laws, but rather the idea of a society which gives individuals and groups, despite their race, religion, economic or educational status, age, gender, or sexual orientation, fair treatment, and a just share of the benefits of society. It is time to value people above profits. Social justice was practiced by the men and women of the boycott. People about the race, not just themselves. This requires asking difficult questions about what happened, why, and lessons learned. We live and are products of our history. And the issues which birthed the modern civil rights movement continue to challenge us as a society. How a people deal with the past informs and shapes the future. And we are now in that future. Anger and mistrust have become entrenched and passed on. Assumptions about who belongs and what difference people are what what different peoples are like formed during a period when racial inequity was taken for granted have become deeply ingrained and speaks to all isms. Though there are fears and dilemmas we must aspire with the same fortitude, courage, steadfastness, and clearness, and leadership of those who were successful in the past. <clears throat> For us to really rise above the fray today, we must first recognize the depths to which so many have been relegated. We must learn to listen. Listen deeply enough to be changed our work we need. Our responsibility is not to become paralyzed either by fear, anger, blame, or guilt over the injustices of history, but to remember them, gain understanding, and then use those memories and understandings as tools to dismantle these tragic histories. More importantly, we must examine the relationship between attitudes and beliefs. On the one hand, and practices and institutions on the other. And then dispel ideas of superior, inferior groups. So that all, all are we, as we say in the island, move confidently into our own futures, secure in the knowledge of people, of the elegance and individually of our uniqueness, sometimes to treat people equally, you have to treat them differently. We're in a very unique place in history today, transitioning from the bus the symbol of the past, to the rocket, the symbol of the future. And we are on the launch pad, ready to take off. The question is, are we ready? Ready for liftoff? Ready to fuel the rocket? Rocket 
rockets don't run on bus fuel. Today, child slavery and legalized segregation may be over. But do we have as many or more suffering from the disease or more appropriate dis-ease of injustice? Producing joblessness, homelessness, voicelessness, powerlessness, street and prison fodder, dying a slow death from social misery and pain. And they are making it clear that they are not going to take it anymore. I'm going to draw a line right here. Do you see the line? I'm going to call out some words. And I want you to tell me which of the words you put above the line and which below. Short, tall. Which above? Below? Fat, skinny. I won't go to any more. <laughs> you get it? I gave you the scantiest of directions into a person who all knew what to do. How do you feel and act for those who don't think and feel like you? I did an exercise because I remember the book that came out but I'm okay and you're okay. I just say, wow, we are. But we are all interested in making sure that I have all those things that are above that line. And they don't see those things that I feel are myself beneath that line. And because that book was banned, I said, it must be something in that I need to know about. <laughs> and that's why I came up with understanding that we all suffer from it. And have to deal with our own. It is up to each of us to, to act today in the spirit of those who so valiantly acted during the month of the bus boycott with an enormous amount of bus fuel. But times have changed. And we need stronger and faster fuel to confront the current social and political issues that seem so bewilderingly evasive today. We need to soar, and that takes rocket fuel. Can we do this? <laughs> there was enough rocket fuel in 2012 to get Barack Obama the first elected African-American president of the United States. The election proved we could muster enough fuel to get the rocket to the launch pad, but not enough for societal changes for the rocket to soar. We are now in a very unique place in history, transitioning from the bus, the symbol of the past, to the rocket, the symbol of the future. And we are on the launch pad. Are you ready? Visualize a pencil, if you will. Focus on the point. Look it up. And let your eyes come down the side of, all the way down to the eraser. Now imagine that pencil is a rocket, emblazoned on the sides with freedom and justice for all. And we, the people, the fuel to protect, to propel it to a just United States. If so, we have made the transition from the bus, the symbol of the past, to the rocket, the future. If we are on the launch pad and ready to lift off, but are we ready? Think about what we need to do as the people to propel the rocket. This year, 2023, marks the anniversary of two major events in our recent history. The 60th of the Montgomery West Boycott, 58th of the anniversary of the Voting Rights March from Selma to Montgomery. Both events rooted in social crisis rose out of the deep feelings of inequality. 
But what do those two events really represent? Change? Make a difference in some particular way to replace with another? Evolution? Development gradually, especially from a simple to a more complex form? Move forward? Transformation? A thorough or dramatic change in the form, appearance, or character? Today we're in a unique position. Transitioning from that bus to the future. Are you on the launch pad awaiting for liftoff? Are we ready? Have we individually or societally developed the right fuel or enough of it for the rocket to probably take off? And so, today shall we say, slavery and legalized segregation are somewhat in the rear view mirror. Do we have as many or more suffering from the dis-ease of injustice, producing joblessness and homelessness? Why? Remember the question I asked you in the beginning? How do you feel, think, and act? for those who don't think and act like you? How does what you believe help to maintain, maintain the injustice producing our diseased society? Each of us must assume the responsibility of this paradigm maintenance. There's still much work to be done, and we must do it individually and collectively. One of the major problems I see in our society today is a denial of responsibility. No one is accountable anymore. Not parents, not the government, not individuals, not anyone. As a result, our civic health is on life support. And a large, large numbers of our people have been made recipients instead of participants. And opportunities have become workfare programs, shorthand training programs, or nothing. Remember the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom? Were any of you present? 60 years ago, on August 28, 1963, Children and youth who were present to hear King invoke his dream have within them the event that have changed the course of history. They were eyewitnesses. Now, adults, the question is, are we living in the world of which King dreamed? Today, 2023, African Americans and other people of color continue to be regulated to poorly resourced and increasingly segregated schools and constitute the country's largest prison population. Voter suppression laws continue to disenfranchise the poor, elderly, and people of color. Racial discrimination in employment, housing, and lending is unchecked and widespread. The question for today is, where has the struggle regenerated in Montgomery brought us in the last 68 years? What have been the gains? That we've been able to enter the restaurant through the front door, to sit down and even be served. What does it mean if you don't have the price of the meal? What has been accomplished? The first 30 years were clearly dedicated to ideological reorientation and redressing ills of past generations. The last 38, however, have seen the rise of an insatiable materialistic culture fueled by mendacious misinformation and obedient consumerism. The issues and personalities of the Montgomery Bus Boycott and the Voting Rights March that
that so challenged our commitment to equality and opportunity. Remain relevant to our contemporary political landscape. It is now time to study and practice the gift the early participants of those earlier movements gave us and to engage in some courageous, deliberative dialogue about the isms that are still with us. Society. When I was growing up, there was one ism. It was called racism. Now we have classism, sexism, and ageism, and religionism. You know who you are by what they is about. <laughs> Anger and mistrust are alive and well. Assumptions about who belongs and who doesn't are even more strongly entrenched and have become more deeply ingrained. As a result, deep battle lines have been drawn. Certain groups of whites still enjoy power and privilege denied others. No matter how we personally feel about it, our race and any other ism still affect our relationship with others. We live and are products of our history. And we are even more challenged than we were in prior years. As civil rights issues have become more substantive, and therefore more of a challenge to the proud workers, the character of racism has changed. There's a much more vocal, virulent strategy than the anti-integration mobs of the late 1950s and early 60s. Society's shift toward a belief that racism has ended discounted the fact that superficialized reform did not allow individuals and institutions to alter structures, attitudes, and in many cases, behavior to fully create equity in a multicultural sense. Transform. This is evidence in the fact that the term minority is still in use, carries a negative connotation, and Greek groups so ascribed are still making demands in the streets that government Grant them being. The fuel we need in the rocket is social justice. But justice refers to more than just the administration of laws, but the idea of a society which gives individuals and groups, despite race or any other ism they have. any other, I should say, that they have, that they may be or represent fair treatment and a just share in the benefits of their society. Those who work towards social justice also value people of our profits. Social justice is practiced by the men and women who shaped me. Men and women of the boycott. Race people, that's what they call themselves. Then. People about the uplift. We must now rethink difference. Begin to think of difference not as an uneasy aggregate of antagonistic them and us, but a constant reforming, transforming we. We need to continue to walk the path, become responsible, and act to one, <coughs> expose all the sham in the American dream. Two, denounce all systems of domination, exploitation, and exploitation, e e e exploration. Three, assure equal opportunity. And four, always challenge the paradigm to transform society. Together, let us hope, pray, and act with compassion 
But above all, let us act and not despair. There can be no plan for renovating society, no scheme for purifying politics, no reform in church or state, no moral, social, or economic question without our stamp of approval. And it is important that we be attuned to all areas of life and living, all the movements of our time, to be able to grasp the deep significance of the crisis we find ourselves in now, drowning and draw from the well of our convictions a sense of how, to what ends, we must shape our fraught society. We are the strident voices of change. Let us be loud and clear about our agenda for all mankind. If we all act as social justice agents, we will acquire the fuel needed not only to lift the rocket, but to let it soar. In this way, we not only honor the life and legacy of all those nameless ones who walked for 382 days or the 54 miles to Montgomery's capital, but we honor the best democratic and liberationist traditions in ourselves. I believe there is unrealized potential and know the daughter of George and Juliet Norman is not resigned. I was taught to prevail, and I'm trying my hardest to be filled with hope. And so, steadfast fool that I am, will continue to believe, to dream, that I am not alone, and that the people who care about we, the people, will find voice and visibility in Montgomery, the city of Mount Vernon, and in the country. To this end, we must lift ourselves out of the mire of Africa. Complacent consumerism, workplace image, <coughs> and through ideological reorientation, redress the ills that confront us. And then, We'll be ready for countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five.